Namaste. Namaste. Today I have a very important guest, Nityanand Mishra, who is in his day job a financial expert in Mumbai, but his real passion is Sanskrit, Sanskrit Shastra, and uh, writing books on this. Uh, and I'm going to be interviewing him on a very special topic because there's a lot of misinformation and distortions about some of our Shastras and translations of Sanskrit by our own people and sometimes very important famous people who, ha who write bestsellers, which means that it's even more dangerous. He being the subject matter expert, I'm going to be asking him questions in order to inform you about the research that he's done. Welcome. Nitranji, pleasure, huh? pleasure to be to be interviewing you. Likewise. So I want to first tell them a little bit about yourself. Sure. All right. So as uh, Rajivji mentioned, so I am uh, I work in the financial industry in the daytime. Uh, by training, I am an engineer from the Gujarat University, uh, followed by an MBA from IIM Bangalore. I've worked for ten years in the investment banking industry, but uh, my passion is, as Rajivji mentioned, Sanskrit, uh, Indian literature, shastras. Indian music and Indian culture. So I, I edit books, I translate, I author books. Uh, some of my books have been on uh, Sanskrit, some of my books have been on uh, Hanuman Chalisa, and uh, one of my books has been on Om. Next year I'm planning to write a book on the Mahabharat and the Upanishads. So uh, uh, like to like to uh, go deeper and deeper into our uh, scriptures, into our shastras, and uh, this is again, I'm uh, following the lineage of my guru, uh, Jagat Guru Swami Rambhadra Chaharaji, who is a guru in the Sri Vaishnava tradition at uh, Chitrakoot. So, taking the light of knowledge forward by reading, by understanding, and by explaining it to people. Uh, we are going to talk about Devdat Patnaik, a very famous writer, interpreting our Shastras, particularly Itihas and Puranas. Uh, very controversial in the sense that he calls all this myth, which I have problem with. Uh, he calls himself a mythologist in the tradition of Wendy Doniger and various Westerners who are uh, talking about all our stuff as myth and sexual and uh, you know looking for human rights issues and caste issues. So he's kind of in that line. But he's at the same time able to convince people that he's giving honest and genuine interpretation because he's an Indian with a Hindu name. Uh, well connected in the Bombay scene, lot of endorsement and so on. So uh, tell us a little bit about what you know of him and uh, kind of an overview of why this is sort of an issue. Sure. So uh, David Patnayak, as Rajivji mentioned, is a very successful and very famous author. He calls himself a mythologist. He says he's not a literator, he's a mythologist. And you see he's all over the place. He has books, he has TV shows. He, he's, uh, he's ubiquitous with his uh, sketches. He's, he's, I must admit, he's talented. He's done he's, a very good job marketing himself. Airports, you get his books more than anybody else when it comes to uh, interpreting our tradition. And nowadays, it's like uh, parents taking pride in their children reading Devdat Patnaik and saying, okay, our kids are reading Devdat Patnaik, so it's kind of a status symbol to read his books. Uh, I must say he's a great illustrator. He has that art, and uh, with that art, along with some great marketing skills, he has established himself as uh, one of the leading authors in this space. In fact, he's probably the most famous author in the space of Puranology, or what he calls as mythology. So, uh, you know, in fact, many uh, friends of mine were impressed with him. Uh, many, uh, a few family members of mine were very impressed with him, especially his uh, book Jaya, the illustrated retelling of the Mahabharata. So uh, I, in fact, never read him uh, because uh, I had looked up his book, the uh, Jaya, and I found it to be a bit shallow. So I never bothered too much about it. Uh, but as and when more and more people in my friend circle and family started praising him, I thought maybe I should take a deeper look at what he writes. So uh, I happened to read his book, My Gita, and I was, it was, I was, I was a bit surprised because I always thought of him as a storyteller. And he has this knack of making stories interesting and, and laying them out for the layperson. So I thought, why would a storyteller write on the Gita, which is a very philosophical text and which, is, which takes years and years to understand. So I picked up, picked up his book, My Gita, and the moment I started reading it, I thought, no, this is something seriously wrong. Yeah. Because he is getting each and every concept right from the minute details to the bigger picture, completely wrong. And he's presenting them as his 
authoritative interpretation. He calls it my Gita. So he says, okay, it's my Gita, I'm free to interpret it. And then he says, if Shankaracharya can interpret it, if Ramanujacharya can interpret it, why can I not interpret it? <laughs> and that is so funny because yeah. uh, Shankaracharya or Ramanujacharya or people who have interpreted or commented on the Gita have spent years learning the scriptures, learning Sanskrit, understanding the language. And here we have somebody, it's akin to somebody not knowing English, reading Hindi translations or adaptations of Shakespeare's works and then calling himself an expert on Shakespeare and saying... And also, he is not part of the parampara in the sense of uh, Adi Shankara or those people. He's not a, he doesn't have the adhikar in the traditional sense either. I would I agree. Mean, I, I don't know if he's initiated, if he's practiced, if he's done all the sadhana, the tapasya, whatever is required to qualify for such a gigantic reinterpretation. Sure, sure. Uh, so, neither, neither that nor I find his knowledge of Sanskrit is completely lacking. So how could a person, I was very intrigued, how could a person like this comment on the Gita and write it and present it as an interpretation? So when I started reading it, I read a few more of his articles and then, you know, there's a Nyaya called the Sheshwat Nyaya in the Indian system, uh, which says that it's like saying, if you taste the water at the seashore, you can conclude that the seawater is saline. It's right. salty. Sampling. Yes. So it's like sampling. So random sampling or, you know, stratified sampling in statistics. Right. right. Sheshwat Nyaya in the Indian system. That if you read some part of works of an author, maybe a book, some articles, a tweet, you can overall get a, you can get a big picture of what this author is about. And if there are so many errors, so many issues with a part of his work, I'm sure they, they would extend to other works of his. So, uh, that's how I got to, you know, uh, read my Gita and I was, I was, I, I felt compelled to let people know that you have a bestseller who is literally pulling wool over your eyes yes. by just writing anything. There are, there are major issues in the work, uh, not only his interpretation of philosophical aspects in the Gita, but also it comes across that he has not even mastered his own sphere, which is the Puranas and the Ithasas. So I, I find that he presents, uh, he markets things as non-fiction. So my Gita is a non-fiction book. Similarly, my Hanuman Chai is a non-fiction book. And he presents narratives from the Mahabharata or the Puranas, which are completely off from what is described in the Mahabharata or Puranas. And we'll see some examples. We will. So that made me conclude that a person who's considered an authority on Puranology or what he calls mythology, has he actually read the original versions of the Mahabharata or the Bhagavad Puran? I don't think so. Mm. He's probably read adaptations, he's probably read translations, maybe the Odia Mahabharata or something. Here's an interesting chart you have done. The different issues that you raise, I think it's important to tell the audience before we go into the details of what are the five or six major kind of things that you find wrong with him and then we'll go into more detail. Sure, so specifically, uh, and this is again based on uh, a a good reading, an in-depth reading of his book, The My Gita, mm -hmm. My Hanuman Chalisa, and uh, some of his articles on the net, uh, some of his uh, tweets as well. So, uh, what I find is there are serious issues in the works of Devdar Patnayak. First and foremost, he calls himself an expert on Puranas and Itihasas. He's considered, you know, uh, by the layperson, he's considered the ultimate authority. In fact, recently when there was this uh, controversy on uh, Shri Shri Ravi Shankar's remark on uh, homosexuality. Uh, a Bollywood actress, Sonam Kapoor, tweeted saying, to get to know more about Hinduism, read Devdat Patnayak. <laughs> and, and Sonam Kapoor is not uh, nobody. She has got, I think, 12 million followers on, the Twitter, on, on Twitter. So a person who's widely considered an authority on Hinduism or Puranas, he narrates things which are so inaccurate from the Mahabharata or the Bhagavad Puran or uh, uh, you know, other itihasas and shastras, which I find very surprising. At least, you know, we, we, say, we say to know your stuff. That's a, if, if I'm a doctor, I should know medical field. If I'm a statistician, I should at least know the ABCs of statistics. If, I'm, uh, if I style myself as a mythologist, or if I style myself as an expert from Puranas, I should have at least read the original Puranas, and I should be at least knowledgeable about them, which I find lacking. So that is one of the major issues, that you have a person who is considered an authority on a subject matter, and he's not. That to me is a big issue. Uh, then, uh, 
now he's he's not only a storyteller. He he's now writing on the Gita, on Hanuman Chalisa, and he, in some articles he writes about uh, you know origins of Sanskrit, on the Aryan invasion theory, and all all sorts of stuff. So what I find so is, it's dangerous because his field is so vast. Yes, so much credibility, and he's funded by some big corporate people. I would guess there so. was the Future Group. He was the chief belief officer or something of the Future the group? group, a yeah. multinational conglomerate uh, in Mumbai. And I think now Reliance supports him, is what they say. Somebody, somebody supports him, some big people support him. Because obviously he has the ability to go and convince people that he he's popularizing Hinduism. Yeah. Sort of thing. Yeah. So when he comes to <coughs> things which are outside the, the story narration part, when he comes to philosophy, like the Gita, there is wild imagination. Imagination running wild. His so imagination. His imagination running wild. So... Uh, for example, uh, you know, he explains philosophical terms which have no, in a way, which have no connection whatsoever to how they are understood in our, in our shastras or in, in our tradition. So he'll invent concepts, he will invent new, new concepts and, and misattribute them to the Gita or to Hanuman Chalisa or specific terms in Sanskrit and then say, okay, this is my interpretation. So uh, that is, to me, is a very serious issue. Well, you can, you can say, it is my imagination, but you cannot say it's non-fiction. You can't say it's non-fiction and philosophy, and then you, you then bring in your own imagination, and uh, you say, this is what the Gita says. That's yeah, it would be okay if he said, I'm just telling you fiction, yeah. and I'm using some of the same names and characters, but I'm writing fiction. So it's not knowledge, it's not philosophy, it's not Shastra. Don't take it as authoritative understanding of our Shastra. That would be different. Which but is he, why he, yeah, but he's saying that I am telling you what the real tradition is. Yeah, which is why I find Amish Tripathi is at least honest in the sense he says his books are fiction. Yeah. Yeah. So here we have Amish Tripathi who clearly says whatever I publish is fiction, it's a retelling, but that's not the case with Hedat Patank. Mm. His, uh, his uh, book My Gita is non-fiction philosophy. That's how Rupa presents it. So yeah. uh, another issue, major mm -hmm. issue with his work is somehow he has this obsession with force-fitting themes of sex, violence, and LGBTQ uh, aspects into our works, into shastras, into even art. So, you know, if he sees two gopis together, he'll say they're lesbians. Right. And that, that to me is like... Uh, An anti-Brahmin, all the way through. All the way through. And anti-NRIs. Anti-NRIs. Yeah. Although his money comes, he go, went on a fundraising to US, so he, he's happy to take the money. Yeah, <laughs> I guess so. <laughs> uh, anti brahmin isn't a lot. Uh, in fact, on Twitter, when I questioned him some of his uh, claims in his book, The Gita, instead of addressing the issues that I had raised, he went on a spree saying, Brahmins have always criticized non-Brahmins and I'm a victim. So attacking you personally rather than addressing the issues. Argumentum at hominem, yeah. yeah. So, uh, and uh, surprisingly, uh, there's, uh, this this would, you know, come as a, uh, come as a, general attack against people who are his critics. So he would say, Brahmins love to criticize me, so if Brahmins criticize me, it's, it means I'm doing good work. And not even caring whether people who are criticizing are actually Brahmins or not, or NRIs or not, because all sorts of people. Uh, I, but I there's an issue, that issue has been resolved regardless, regardless of who raised it. True. You True. raise an issue. True. You did not say the issue is valid because I'm a Brahmin. You did not yeah. use your Brahminness to make the issue valid. Sure. The issue is valid issue on its own merits. Sure. So he owes you a response on the merits. True. And cannot attack you for any identity uh, type of... Well, you do that when you don't have anything to say in response, <laughs> right? I mean, uh, we, we, have right. Seen, we have seen this in, uh, <clears throat> in the case of several people that yeah. when they are questioned and have nothing to say, they would just attack right. uh, the, the community or... Uh, right. The, the nationality of the of the critic in his book my gita what are what are some errors the book is full of errors <laughs> but uh, uh, i see there are several categories of errors and uh, uh, in my review of the book i called it a marvel of scholarly ineptitude wow uh, which okay. is which for a non fiction book and for somebody who's considered a subject matter expert is is a very scathing uh, yes. uh, indictment it's a serious it, thing it, it is it is a marvel of scholarly ineptitude there are errors all over the book, and uh, uh, the the major kind of errors I I uh, I would like to see them in several categories. So one of the categories is wrong narration from uh, Puranas and Itihasas. Okay. So uh, let's see. Uh, you 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 if you think Devdutt Patnaik knows uh, his stuff, 
and if he narrates from an, an episode from the Bhagavad Purana, he would consider that more or less he would stick to the original narrative in the Bhagavad Purana. Now, here's an example where I pick a narrative from the Bhagavad Purana in which it's a very, uh, it's a Yagya Patni's episodes in the Bhagavad where uh, Patnayak is telling how things happened. And we see that in seven lines, he make as many as five blatant errors. Okay, so tell us then. Sure. Yeah. So on page 106, I'll, I'll just read what... 106 uh, of his book. 106 of uh, uh, the book, My Gita. Okay. So he says, A similar story is found in the Bhagavad Puran, where Krishna, while tending to his cows, comes upon a few yajmanas performing uh, yajna and asks them for food. Uh, they ignore him. So he goes to their wives and the yajna patnis feed him all the offerings they had prepared for the yajna. The yajmanas are furious but then realize that their wives look content while they feel angry and frustrated. So having read the Bhagavad Purana episode myself, uh, I know that there are major errors here. And you would not expect this in a non-fiction work. So seven lines, five errors, let's see what they are. So Patnaik says that a few yajmanas were doing this. Now the yajman is... As we all know, yajman is somebody who sponsors a yajna. Hmm. So if there's a yajman and there's somebody who performs a yajna. So the yajman uh, uh, gives authority to the, uh, to the pandits to perform the yajna on his behalf. So are there yajmans present? No, there are brahmins present who are performing yajna for themselves. There's no sponsor there. In the real story? In the Bhagavad Puran. In the real story, Which there is, is no the, yajman, there is no sponsor and he talks about that yes. there are. There are this, uh, this is the 23rd uh, <coughs> chapter of the 10th canto of okay. Bhagavad Puran. Uh, he says, uh, Krishna comes across yajmans while tending to cows and asks them for food. Well, as per the Bhagavata, Krishna is relaxing on the banks of Yamuna. And there are some friends of his who go and ask uh, the Brahmins who are performing the yajna for food. So, so Krishna is, sub is uh, confused with friends. Yes. So rather than uh, the cowherd boys going and asking for food for Krishna, he says, Krishna goes to the yajmanas and asks them for food. Okay, he says the yajmanas ignore Krishna. Well, as Krishna never went there, there's no chance of the yajmanas ignoring Krishna. Right. In fact, in fact uh, there, there were no yajmanas. So there's, there's Brahmins and if Krishna went there, there uh, himself, uh, they wouldn't have ignored him. But uh, uh, because they were cowherd boys, so they said, right. okay, they ignored their message. Then he says that Krishna goes to the wives of the yajmanas, the yajnipatnis, and they feed him. Now here's, interest, here's what is interesting. So Krishna sends the cowherd boys to the Yajnipatnis. In the, in the real story. That's right, that's yeah. right. And then they come to him with food. So it's rather than Krishna going to them, it's the Yajnipatnis who come to them, uh, to, come to Krishna with food, and they offer him all sorts of uh, uh, food prepared. So again, uh, just just total confusion between who is who is the agent, who is the active agent, who is the hard, passive Hard agent. facts, wrong. Very wrong. And this is, this is not even philosophy, this is just simple narration <coughs> from the Bhagavad Purana. If, if, he, if he would have read uh, any, any translation, any English or Hindi translation of the Bhagavad Puran, this is a straightforward set of events. And then finally, uh, now this is a more serious thing here. Patnaik says that the Yajmanas are furious and they realize they feel angry and frustrated. On the contrary, the Brahmins in the Bhagavad Puran realize their mistake that they ignored the message of the cowherd boys, which was sent by Krishna, and they repent. So rather than presenting rather than saying that yes uh, what actually happened as per the Bhagavad Puran was they repented that they did not give food to Krishna he is painting them as negative characters that they they are furious and they are angry and frustrated I don't know maybe he wants to paint this as a, a pic, you know uh, uh, subjugation of females and yeah yeah some, and, and create some kind of a bhed some True. tension going on between True. Krishna and other people uh, so yeah. getting the facts wrong uh, and then, then creating some kind of a later on, some connecting the dots to connect, uh, make a motive out of it or something. True. Or leave a suggestion in the reader's mind yeah. to that yeah. effect. So this is one example where, you know, seven lines, five errors. And uh, I was, I was uh, so surprised that how could a subject matter expert make so many errors in such a simple narration. Now this example, maybe not that, uh, uh, maybe I would still say it's not a big distortion. It's maybe a lot of errors. but. Let's come to a narration from uh, the Mahabharata. You have wrong narration and that narration is attributed to something which, uh, which is very surprising. So uh, Patnayak in my Gita on page 198 and uh, the following pages, he's talking about 
the birth of the Pandu princes and the Kaurav princes. So what he says is that they were in a competition. Uh, so Kunti, Madri and Gandhari were in a competition to produce more babies. Now maybe it fits in his uh, with his uh, you know subtle agenda of painting <laughs> the Indian society as somebody who which has uh, always wanted male babies or, or not, I'm not sure. But when he narrates from the Mahabharata, he says that, uh, and I quote him, the competitive spirit kicks in. Pandu knows that Kunti has a mantra which, uh, which she can uh, invoke to, uh, to get a child. And Pandu immediately asks Kunti to summon Dharma. And uh, that's how they, uh, they beget Yudhishthir. So there is no competitive spirit. They are not aware of uh, Gandhari getting pregnant. They are, not, uh, they are not in a competition to produce more babies. But it's, it's, uh, it's only Pandu learning of the mantra and asking her to summon Dharma and get a child. The next claim, Patak says that Pandu asks after three sons, Pandu asks for more sons, but Kunti says she cannot use the mantra for more than three times. So Pandu begs her to share the mantra with Madri. Kunti has already used the mantra four times because with Karna, with Yudhishthir, with uh, Bhim and with Arjun. So there is no such restriction in the Mahabharata. So, so it seems like he hasn't even read very basic facts about the story. No, there's no, there's no fact checking. There's no cross checking. I would say if I'm a, if I'm an expert on a subject matter, if I'm writing a book, I would at least consult the original text and verify what I'm writing is true. Yeah, what it seems. And his edit, his uh, publisher should check, and his support, his uh, endorsement people should check. I mean, they're all putting their reputation sure. on hard facts being totally wrong. Sure, sure. So he says that uh, Kunti claims that she cannot use the mantra three times. So Pandu begs Kun, uh, Kunti to share the mantra with Madri, but nothing of this sort happens. Kunti, in fact, says she understands dharma and therefore she is not going to have more children, but rather Madri should have children. So she voluntarily shares the mantra with Madri and it's not Pandu begging her to share it with Madri. So in fact, Kunti is exercising restraint. So it's not, it's not about... Uh, Pandu being desperate, Kunti not being able to have more sons, so Pandu begging her to share, that, nothing of that sort happened in the as for So the not only are his facts wrong, but the implication he's drawing is actually just the opposite. It is. It so is. he's fabricating facts to create an impression which is a completely wrong impression. It is Madri, in fact, who wants children and uh, wants a child which uh, asks Pandu to request Kunti to share the mantra. It's not, it's not begging, but it's requesting because uh, there's no competition here. Uh, Madri says she is not unhappy on hearing of the birth of 100 births, 100 sons of Gandhari. So there's nobody competing to get more sons. It's actually very different from what Patnaik is narrating in his book. Again, uh, so uh, now again, uh, when, when Patnaik talks about the birth of the 100 sons of Gandhari, what Patnaik says is that when Gandhari learns of Pandu's sons, she's desperate to get more children. So she says that if Pandu got three sons with Kunti, if Kunti has three sons, I have to have 97 more sons than Kunti, so I should have 100 sons. In fact, nothing of this sort happened. Uh, Gandhari, in fact, asked for a boon to have 100 sons from Vyasa. And Vyasa says, okay, you will have 100 sons. So this all happened before Kunti got three sons. So there's no competition again. So he's got everything wrong. Everything just, mixed just whole, up. Just complete mixed up. Com Completely mixed complete up. Hocus pocus. And then he says that uh, Gandhari gets her midwife to strike her belly with an iron rod. I don't know where he gets his Nothing like from. that. Nothing, Nothing of that like sort <laughs> happened. Nothing of that sort happened. So Gandhari strikes her belly herself. Uh, there's no iron rod. There's nothing uh, of that sort. And then there's a ball of flesh which is divided into 100. Uh, it divides itself into 100. So uh, there's no desire on part of Gandhari to get 97 more sons than Kunti and 98 more sons than Madri. Uh, so here, here are some, you know, these, these, this example shows that not only are the facts wrong, but he assigns motives which are completely not there. And this, That's very dangerous. this to me is a distortion. This because you know, when somebody pretends that detail hai, he knows all the little details, he knows all of that stuff and he's referencing, then the average Indian who is so misinformed and ignorant is very grateful that he is teaching us all this stuff and takes the whole thing at face value. Not only are all these facts fabricated, but they are organized to convey a message which is wrong message, which, which has, we will see as we go, political motives. It is in fact trivializing, trivializing everything. Yeah. For example, if you say that 
uh, oh, they had they had so many sons because they were in a competition with each other to have more sons. It's like trivializing the characters in the Mahabharata, right? Which uh, in a non-fiction work is, is it's is, an insult to the 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 deep character development that exists in the narrative. Everybody in Gandhari, Kunti, <coughs> Madri, they are very strong characters in the Mahabharata. Everybody, uh, each one of them has their own distinctive traits, their own distinctive strengths and weaknesses. And you, if you just trivialize this as okay, they were all in a race to have more sons. The next one is a very, very important uh, example of error because this is where a very profound concept that goes all through our tradition uh, is completely misrepresented, distorted, and turned into some kind of a social political idea. Yeah. Yeah, tell So uh, uh, <coughs> another category of errors uh, which I found in the Mai Gita were imagination running wild. I don't know whether it's intentional or whether it's uh, uh, it's unintentional, but uh, in some cases, there's just wild imagination applied to, uh, or maybe it's not so wild. Maybe it's it's by design. Imagination applied to distort philosophical concepts. Now let's see, on page 190 uh, of the Mai Gita, uh, Patnaik talks about the three kinds of bodies, and so he explains what is called the Karan Shari. So what he reads, what he says, and I and I quote, in the Upanishads. Kshetra is seen as a third layer of Deha. It is the outermost layer known as a social layer or the Karan Sharir. Then comes the physical layer or the Sthul Sharir and finally the mental layer or the Sukshma Sharir. The social body refers to property inherited at birth or earned through effort." Unquote. This is pretty nonsensical. Completely. Comple uh, Karan Sharir being translated as social body. And making it outermost, when in fact it is the <coughs> innermost. It is more so the innermost part of our being, he switches and calls it outermost. And then on top of that, he says this is this is your social body, which is the Karan Sharir. And it is property inherited at birth. And it has to do with your property, real estate, your work. I mean, this is complete baloney. Completely. Completely. <laughs> <laughs> so as well, uh, as you would know, in the yoga and Vedanta traditions, there are three bodies mentioned. There is the Sthul Sharir, which is the outermost Sharir, which is the physical body. There is the Sukshma Sharir, which is a subtle body. And the Karan Sharir is the innermost body, which is a causal body. Causal body. Now, Patnaik makes it the outermost body, calls it a social body, and relates it to property inherited at birth. Now, where did he make this up? I'm not sure. But to explain something which is an established concept in yoga and Vedanta as completely different, I don't know. I don't know what sense So you see, while somebody may be entitled to interpretation to some extent, this is blatant uh, falsification. Distortion. Complete, Complete distortion. distortion. There are 128 Upanishads which mention Kshetra. And I found this in searching the Sanskrit documents for which all Upanishads mention Kshetra. There are 140 Upanishads on the Sanskrit documents website. So I looked which all have the term Kshetra, there are 28 of them. And not a single one of them explains Kshetra as a social body or an outermost body. So, where is Devdat Patnaya getting his stuff from? And what Karan is, Sharir. What is he smoking? And, and Karan Sharir, you wouldn't find anybody calling that social body. Nobody, nobody. And nobody calling it outermost or relating it to property. Uh, so, that's one example. Uh, let's come to another example. Uh, now, in the Mai Gita on <coughs> page 140. So, uh, it's a very important uh, part of the Gita where Arjun asks uh, Krishna six questions on, you know, what is Brahma, what is Adhyatma, what is Karma, what is Adhibhut, what is Adhidaivat, and what is Adhiyajna. So, Patnaik is explaining all these six terms. So, uh, again, he translates or explains it as uh, something which does not make any sense. So, I, I read, uh, he, he says, in chapter 8, Krishna connects the impersonal mind of Brahma Brahman and impersonal matter Adhibhut to the personal mind which is Adhyatma and the personal body which is Adhidaiva via impersonal action which is Karma and personal connection which is Adhiyanya. The first time I read it, I was like, is this uh, like what? Random variables? Like, <laughs> you know, <laughs> I deal in statistics with random variables and wow. is, this, is this noise? Is this. Is the, this uh, there's too many errors. Rumblings yeah. of in, uh, some some intoxicated mind, or yeah. what is it? And you know, when when you when you actually read what the Gita says, the Gita says it's imperishable supreme. It says Aksharam Paramam Brahma. Patnaik says it is the impersonal mind. 
Now, how come Akshar Param me becomes the impersonal mind? This nothing got nothing to do with the mind. So it's completely off. Uh, the second term, Adhyatma. So the Gita says it's the Swabhava or the own nature. Hmm. Now Patnaik explains it as personal mind. So Brahma is impersonal mind and Adhyatma is personal mind. Nothing to do with what the Gita says. Right. The third term, which is Karma. So the Gita says it is the release or offering or the oblation which causes the birth and the evolution of living beings. Patnaik calls it impersonal action. Action maybe yes, but what is personal or impersonal about it? I have no idea. Maybe he's just putting in words because he wanted to talk about, talk about impersonal mind, personal mind. So there must be something called personal action. So here I feel that he's trying to cater to a certain Western model, some Westernized models, and trying to show that he's, his interpretation will be more accessible to those guys. Maybe. Yeah, because this, is, this sort of jargon sometimes is used by those people. Yeah. Then he talks about Adibhut. The Gita says it's the Kshara Bhava, which means the perishable nature. And Patnaik says it's impersonal matter, maybe matter, but what is impersonal about it? I'm not sure. Then Adhidaivat. So Gita says it is the Purusha or the cosmic being is Adhidaivat. Patnaik says it's a personal body. Now the Gita says Adhidaivat is the Purush, which is a, which is not material. Right. And Patnaik is calling it personal body, which is material. So he's confusing between matter and spirit, right. which which in a in a book on the Gita is a grave mistake. Yes. It is, uh, it is like saying, uh, you know, confusing digital with continuous or, you know. Right. Yeah. <laughs> Finally, when it comes to Adhiyadnya, Krishna says, Ahameva, I alone, is Adhiyadnya. But Naik says, it's a personal connection. Now, Krishna is saying, I am Adhiyadnya, but Naik is saying, it's a connection. So, is there no difference between people who are connected, the connection? It's almost like ignoring the Gita's own description. In a book on the Gita. In a book on the Gita, ignoring, without arguing or giving a rationale why he wants to reject it and coming up with a completely new concocted vocabulary and uh, you know way of thinking and framework like it's a he's taking some facts from uh, data from the Gita and putting it in, his, in a completely different spin. Another example of wild imagination and this is a pervasive error in his book the My Gita not only the My Gita he has made this error over and over again in many books and many articles so to explain the term Brahman which is a very, very widely used term in very Indian, important term in Indian philosophy, and yes. uh, <coughs> so he's uh, got it wrong. He's got it completely wrong in as many as twenty-eight places in my Gita. In one book. In one book. Wow. So uh, somehow he gets into these folk etymology modes. Uh, he, I, I don't think he knows much of Sanskrit. I don't think he knows any of Sanskrit. So he kind of imagines what Sanskrit word means. Sanskrit words mean, and so he says, "Okay, Brahman." Would means, uh, bra means expansion and man means mind. So he says that Brahman means expanding the mind, <laughs> which is completely wrong. Hmm. The, the meaning, the, the word for ma mind in Sanskrit is manas and right. not man. Right. And it comes from the root bre and the man suffix, which means somebody something that grows is Brahman or something right. that makes you grow is Brahman. Now there's no mind there, but Naik thinks there's a mind there. So he says, okay, a brahmachari is somebody who expands his mind. The mind is something, I don't know how it expands. Well, heat makes solid expand, solid expand, but I don't know how what makes the mind expand, I'm not sure. So, in as many as 28 places in the Maya Gita, Patnaik says, Brahman is expanding the mind, so it has to do with expansion of the mind. So, a student is expanding the mind. Uh, so, he has interpreted the, 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 the man part of Brahman as manas. Right, right. And then he says, okay, fine. I have an expanded mind, so I have realized Brahman. So this is this is a pervasive error in the whole book, a book of 230 or 240 <coughs> odd pages. I'm broad-minded, sir. I'm Brahman. I'm Brahman. I'm broad-minded. My mind is broad already. <laughs> uh, I don't know what he how he explain then Brahman because then it's the same root, so <laughs> I don't know. But uh, uh, 28 places in a book of 230 pages, the same error over and over again. How do you explain it? Is it, it, it it's just sloppy work? So, uh, I don't know where he picked up this etymology, but he just goes on repeating again and again in books, in articles, and people take it as, uh, as the Brahma Vakya, mm. as something that is true. So, you know, the, the sentence of somebody with an expanded mind. <laughs> right. So, this is, this is pretty startling. And his audience have no sus 
suspicion of this. They just take everything at face value, eating out of his hand, glorifying such a great guy. Yeah. No, yeah. And you are the first person who's really dug into this, and I'm very grateful because he's he's telling us. Don't take it at face value. Do some due diligence. Check it out, and don't uh, miseducate yourself or your children. True, true, very true. And here's another one on page uh, 21 of his book. Right. So I I find uh, this person is obsessed with finding themes related to sex, violence, and uh, reading uh, the lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender themes, even when nothing of this sort exists in in uh, in Hindu texts. So, for example, you know, uh, you've heard the word Aastik. Yes. You all know what Aastik means. Yes. Aastik is somebody who believes in God. Aastik is somebody who believes in the Vedas. Uh, but as per Patnaik, no, it's something more than that. When explaining the word <coughs> Aastik and Nastik, he says, uh, they reiterated the concept of Iti, which means as things are, accepting the reality of sex and violence, desires and conflicts in relationships, household and life. Those who affirmed iti were the astikas. Those who denied iti were the nastikas. So, what he's saying is, those who accept the reality of sex and and violence, desires and conflicts, uh, are the that is what iti means, and they are the astika. Those right. who those who accept these kind of right. <laughs> now, firstly, the word <laughs> astik and nast the word astik and the word Gnostic have nothing to do with Iti. So if he went to a sex club <laughs> and those who accept various things going on in the sex club, he would say they are the Astika. That is what he's basically saying. I would that those so. who are accepting the, this reality of sex and so if he goes to a place where the mode is sex and violence, uh, he would say that that is the reality that you have to accept to be an insider, the Astika. So that's how what he's insinuating is the nature of the the Shastras. Right. That's now, the, firstly, the words Astik and Nastik, as per Sanskrit grammar, have nothing to do with the word Iti right. in the first place. So his basic premise is wrong. Right. Uh, astik and Nastik, the words come from the word Asti. Asti, which means is. Mm. Uh, you know the Persian word Ast? Uh, there's a couplet, Gar Firdos, Bar Ruhe, Zameen Ast, Hameen Ast, Hameen Ast, Hameen Ast. Right. Ast in Persian means is, and that come, that is related to Asti in Sanskrit, which means is. So, asti means is, astik is derived from asti, uh, and it means somebody who believes in God is, God exists, or somebody who believes in Vedas is an astik, and somebody who does not is a nastik. So, uh, firstly, he makes the <coughs> this claim that asti and nas, astik and nastik are related to iti somehow, and then he says iti is related to the reality of sex and violence somehow. And then he puts these two together and says, Astikas are people who believe in the reality of sex and violence and desires and all that, which uh, which to me is is I don't know. It's 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 so it's so funny that uh, you know, it's tragic. <laughs> but you know, as he's positioning himself to be a reference and source of authority for other writers, other thinkers who will say, okay, we're quoting Devdat Patnaik and that's legitimate. That's what we're supposed to do. What he's done here is pretty dangerous because from now on, uh, you, if you're an astika, the, you will be insinuated as somebody who believes in sex and violence, and that is the definition of why you call astika. Mm -hmm. So now the whole, all the whole tradition of astika and who, are, what they believe and Vedas and all that can be subject to all kinds of twisting. Sure, very sure. dangerous. It is. It is. It is. If 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 this person is selling, I, when I read the Mai Gita, it was a tenth imprint already. So I don't know how many, how many thousands or hundreds of thousands of these books have been sold, and you multiply that with the number of readers who are reading them, and they are believing that okay, Astik is somebody who believes in the reality of sex and violence. Devdat Patnaik, very logically, analytically, but using fabricated assumptions, argues that Astika is somebody who believes in sex and violence. That's the definition. It's a, it's a big deal. Again, uh, another example. Let's say, let's say you know, uh, you know the the gopis of Braj. So they are examples of they are exalted examples of uh, bhakti in our uh, tradition. Uh, in the Narad Bhakti Sutra, uh, one of the examples is that the bhakti is as was the bhakti of uh, the gopis of uh, the gopikas of Braj. And in fact, uh, even in the Gita, when uh, Krishna says Mame Kam Sharanam Braj, uh, commentators have explained that 
Mame kam sharanam Raja means come to me as the Gopikas of Vraj came to me. Right. So uh, nobody would have imagined that the Vraj Gopikas together, nobody in the tradition would have even remotely imagined that there was something more than bhakti towards Krishna and friendship among them. So now, here's an example. Uh, this was put up on Instagram and uh, Twitter by Devar Patnayak. This is a painting which has Krishna and Radha under an umbrella. And there are two ladies in a cave and then he questions, are they lesbians? <laughs> okay. Now, so you see two ladies together. Yes, they're, they're two sakis together. The two gopis This together. is the Wendy Doniger influence on him, who is a pal of his. We'll come to that in a while. Yeah. And and they're not even, they, they're just sitting and talking to each other and says, are they lesbians? And so this was on Twitter, this was on uh, Instagram. There's nothing remotely of that sort in the painting tradition <coughs> of Krishna and Radha and Gopikas. And you just say, okay, are they lesbians? I mean, this is, is, this, is this just trivializing things or is it just reading things where there's nothing exists? I don't know where, why is this obsession with finding uh, these themes everywhere? You know, if you are a Krishna Bhakt, I mean, this is quite, quite sad. Uh, quite sad to put this kind of a... I mean, I've spent 25 years complaining and criticizing people like Wendy Doniger and all these other people. And here is Devdat Patnaik, our, one, supposedly one of our own guys who's doing it 10 times worse and being accepted by our people just because he's, uh, he's made up into this famous fellow. So, you know, then I don't know if, if, if that, if just having two ladies in a frame makes them lesbians, then uh, I, don't know, I don't know where the line stops. Like, uh, you, you can have, you can read that theme everywhere. Virtually See, what he's doing is he's providing the masala for this kind of uh, people who are looking for all these things. Uh, so they can start saying uh, Gita for lesbians. Uh, yeah. <laughs> uh, there'll be some kind of thing coming out, uh, you know, and uh, uh, you know, Krishna Bhakti for lesbians, this sort of a thing. So, but it's irresponsible. Well, let's let's say I uh, personally I don't have anything against anybody's orientation, but reading a theme and force fitting a theme yes. where nothing exists, yes. that is just not done. So this is not he's not against lesbians or anything. He's just saying that is not what the Gita is saying. It, the text is not saying that. That is not what the painting is saying. That That's is not, not what the painting is saying. It's basically falsifying our tradition in order to be politically correct with a certain audience. Sure. What we may think of that audience and all that, I personally have no problem. But let's not force interpretation into our text. Another major problem with David Patnaik is that uh, he often, uh, in his books and his articles, he explains Sanskrit words and concepts and uh, uh, you know, gives etymologies. So you would you would assume that somebody who explains Sanskrit words has done some homework, has at least looked up a dictionary. There's or, a gloss of, uh, uh, I'm a scholar. Yeah. That kind of an image he's creating. And if I give an etymology, if I say that the word, uh, you know, uh, uh, the, that the word manuscript is derived from manus, which means hand, and script, which means to write, uh, y you would assume that I'm talking specific stuff. So I would have looked up something. I would have done my homework before I talk about it. I won't go and say, okay, friendship uh, comes from the word friend and ship and means two friends who sit in a ship, they, they, there's friendship between them, so no. So uh, a lot of times, in fact, m more than more than uh, majority of the times when he talks about Sanskrit words, their etymologies, he gets them completely wrong, which betrays a profound ignorance of Sanskrit. And so if, well, nothing against <coughs> it. If you're, if you're a mythologist, if you call yourself a mythologist, you're writing on Purans, you, you don't know Sanskrit, I don't have anything against you. But if you're talking about Sanskrit words... But don't pretend to know. If Here yeah. he says, he claims that he heard the Bhagavad Gita for months in the original Sanskrit, at the beginning of his book. My God. So he claims that. And, and when such a person who claims that I heard the Bhagavad Gita for months in the original Sanskrit, doesn't know even basic Sanskrit, then there's something seriously wrong. There's, a, there's an image being put up that, yes, I know, uh, I can explain etymologies, and when you cannot, then uh, uh, it, it's uh, uh, it's it's very uh, it's very annoying. It's, uh, so let's take an example. In a recent article uh, published on the Daily O, Patnaik says that Sanskriti. He's talking about culture, Sanskriti. Very important word, Sanskriti. So he's saying it derives from the two words sam and akriti, and then he relates sam to the sam and visham tal in Indian music. So somehow the word Sanskriti comes from not from sama plus akriti, but it comes from sam plus kriti, uh, where the grammatical rule results in an additional s. But this is completely wrong etymology. And then he explains it in his different ways. A common word, made up etymology, and then a made up explanation. We'll see some more examples. Yes. So we, let's, let's say uh, we go to uh, My Gita, page 7. He's explaining the term Bhagwan, page 7, page 71, 130. This is pretty serious, yeah. 
सो ही से दैट भगवान भग मीन्स स्लाइस और अ पोर्शन एंड भगवान मीन्स समबड़ी हु इज द मास्टर ऑफ ऑल स्लाइस और ऑल पोर्शन वेल एनी बड़ी हु नोज बेसिक संस्कृत और इवन हिंदी और इवन अ लैंग्वेज लाइक तेलुगु वु टेल यू दैट भग इज नॉट पोर्शन भाग इज पोर्शन Now this is a difference between a short wall and a long wall. A and A. A and A. These are the first two letters of the Devanagari or alphabet in any la- any Indian language. A yeah. and A. Most Indian languages begin with A and A. So if he doesn't know the difference between uh, uh, bhag and bhag, and then he is explaining that okay, bhag means a portion or slice, so bhagwan means somebody. Well, that is that is shocking. That is shocking. And this is not just a single example. Well, it also comes when. he talks he confuses between letters consonants mm. so uh, when he is explaining samadhi in my gita now samadhi is a word uh, which is very commonly used in yoga and what it means is that uh, something in which your mind is absorbed so this is samadhiyate mano asmin iti samadhi so it comes from the root uh, dha which means uh, and sama of uh, prefix and dha the root and that's the word samadhi Now, how Patnaik explains it? Very interesting. So, on page two thirty-two of my Gita, he says the word samadhi is based on two words, sama, which is uh, which means the first beat of musical cycle in Hindustani music, and adi, which means origin. Now, see, adi origin is the is the consonant the, and samadhi is the consonant the, the two different letters. So, like. a uh, and a uh, now the and the also he mixes up mixes up so a person who's writing a book on the gita doesn't even know the abc's of sanskrit doesn't even know or, the or, difference or between basic basic language hamari sab languages mein hai this is a uh, can't be mixed with a uh, and the can't be mixed with the yeah so a person who doesn't know the basic difference between two letters of sanskrit or even odia which is his mother tongue so based on this is <laughs> completely wrong interpretation of what it means yeah, completely wrong this is samadhi has nothing to do with beginning nothing to do with music so uh, somehow he brings in this wild imagination he Uh, puts on uh, this is uh, facade of having you know this etymology the explanations and gives completely wrong interpretations and distorted meanings to words he's a facade master so there's he's creating generating his own myth there's a myth of devdar patnaik i i would guess so i would guess so <laughs> <laughs> now let's Amazing. go to another uh, another example where you know again <clears throat> brahman he is explained it pervasively incorrectly in his book now he uh, he doesn't know the difference between the words brahman and brahman yes so these are two very different words now brahman means brahman is the varna brahman brahman is the vedic text brahman but brahman is something very different mm. now he hasn't he doesn't know the difference between these two words and and mixes this whole explanation this a lot of europeans also got wrong and he so he's pretty obsolete because nowadays westerners are a little more lot more sophisticated and know this kind of a thing but yeah. he is completely wrong yeah. but this is uh, this is confusing two different letters two different words two different concepts. completely different ideas completely different ideas yeah so uh, uh, these these are some examples of uh, you know uh, 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 interestingly so he's he's right he's writing a book on the gita he's explaining a verse on the gita and he confuses the word in the original verse with some other word mm. so this is ultimate sloppy work i would say so he he's explaining this word uh, which is uh, bhuti in the gita which is uh, you know the last verse in the or the last verses in the gita uh, yatra yogeshwara krishna yatra partha dhanudhara uh, tatra shir vijay ar bhuti dhruvani tirmati uh, this is uh, the sanjay saying where there is krishna and where there is arjun there there is shri vijay bhuti and uh, uh, all these things are are there so instead of bhuti patnaik says it is bhu confusing bhuti for bhu bhuti means prosperity hmm. patnaik says it is bhu bhu is dominion and then hmm. he relates that to uh, dominion and he relates that to shri and bhu dhruva is the word which means fixed and he confuses it with the masculine word dhruva which is the devotee hmm. so uh, uh, dhruva nitir matir mama that's the verse in the gita uh, patnaik says it is dhruv so it's bhu and it's shri bhuti go becomes bhu dhruva becomes dhruva and everything goes for a toss so there's garbage in garbage out mm. doesn't understand the word confuses for some other word and then builds a whole pack of cards around it that this has got to do with the two consorts of vishnu 
with the devotee dhruva, with dominion, with something, with something. So, uh, an example, another example of uh, how you don't have the knowledge of the basic words and you're trying to explain a text mm. uh, in a language which you completely don't understand. So, the whole thing he's made up. So, he, he's turned it into his own myth. He's making a myth out of a real It's thing. his own fantasy world. Fantasy world. So, he, he calls it my Gita. It's actually my own fantasy world. It's yeah. not. It's not just. It's not just my Gita. It's yeah. my own. My own Sanskrit. It's my own grammar. It's my own Puranas. It's my own. My own reality. My own reality. My own reality. <laughs> he is living in his own reality. Uh, for sure, he is. Yeah. So let's discuss his uh, Brahmin hatred. <laughs> this seems like everywhere. Seems to be. Uh, seems to have some uh, something against Brahmins, or uh, you know, I don't know what. But uh, uh, yeah. So this. Uh, uh, when I started questioning him on Twitter. I got some good response uh, uh, and uh, when people started questioning him that would you like to respond to uh, to somebody who's raising Paul Secondus book. So he went on a complete uh, spree of tweeting against Brahmins and there was a lot of uh, generalizations. Uh, you could, I don't know if you may call it Brahmin phobia or Brahmin hatred, uh, but an example of his tweet uh, during that time was, uh, this was one of the recent ones. Uh, when uh, uh, I think Abhinav Agarwal uh, d uh, criticized him on his blog, he just wrote, Brahmins love abusing non-Brahmins who wrote on Gita. <laughs> it's a long, long history as you know. Brahmin criticism indicates endorsement. Again, uh, this was back in January, he tweeted something of the order uh, of the sort uh, that Brahmins uh, could not cross the ocean and when it became lucrative, they, they, uh, they gave up that rule. So, uh, I don't know why because uh, if you're being asked, if you're being questioned on your book, uh, which is a best-selling book, you're a known author, you're being questioned on your book, you'd expect that the response would be specific. But this was a, uh, just generalizing that this is, this is Brahmins abusing non-Brahmins. None of you criticized him for his caste, right? You, you don't care. You, yeah, you don't care. It doesn't matter. Uh, you, you, you criticized a particular point, page number, this, that, this is a wrong translation. And so he ought to be smart enough and honest enough with enough integrity to answer in a specific way. I mean, if they had done some insult to, to him personally, then you could say, okay, he's also lost his temper and is responding this way. But for him to start criticizing the whole community and the whole category and whatnot because some, one of them raised a particular issue shows that he's really got not, not even in control. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And somehow this spills over to uh, other things. So, uh, in, a, in, a, in a recent article, on the Hindustan Times, uh, he is talking about his book My Hanuman Chalisa and he said, another reason for writing this book was that I wanted everyone to read about Hanuman Chalisa which has earlier been limited only to the Brahmins. Now this is very strange because uh, the Hanuman Chalisa is not even in Sanskrit, it's in Avdi which is a uh, popular language. Which is yeah. a language spoken by crores of people, yeah, yeah, yeah. common people yeah. in Uttar Pradesh, in central Uttar Pradesh, our region. Yeah. So how can that be restricted to Brahmins? Yeah. And Hanuman Chalisa was never restricted to Brahmins. So somehow he's saying, I am the savior. I am writing this book so that non-Brahmins can read it when in fact they've been reading it for centuries. So, so he doesn't have the basic knowledge of Hanuman Chalisa. Of the, what, language, of the of language, language, of the of which language, the context, the social context uh, in which that language has been very popular. It's a grassroots la uh, language. It is. It is. It is as Aam Admi as it gets. Sure. This sure. Around February, uh, so when I was uh, criticizing him of, on on, <coughs> on my Gita, so he he uh, made a tweet where he misquoted and then he uh, assigned a motive to Brahmin. So he what he said was Panini said that for pots you go to potters. But for language, you don't go to expert Brahmin, you go to the market, common people. And he's attributing this to Panini. Now, first of all, Panini yes. yeah. never wrote anything of that sort. The quotation occurs in the Mahabhashya of Patanjali, where the context and the content both are completely different. So firstly, it's not Panini, it's Patanjali. Right. That's completely wrong. Right. And secondly, what the actual quote says is completely different. So what Patanjali actually says is that if you need a pot, you go to a potter and say, make me a pot. Right. But if you need a word, you don't go to a grammarian and say, make me a word because you already know words. Right. So this is what Patanjali says. Yeah. There is no Brahmin. He only talks about a grammarian. There is no common people. He just says that words are not made by grammarians. Rather, words are used and explained right. by grammarians. Right. So somehow he misattributes it to Panini and then brings in Brahmins to criticize them. 
that you don't go to Brahmins, you go to common people. So basically, one more time, uh, one more example, just fabricate the facts to fit your ideology. Sure. the point you're trying to make. Sure. Uh, this, you know, uh, not just Brahmins, but uh, sometimes he just attacks people and uh, he has this uh, these uh, meltdowns on meltdowns on Twitter. Here's an interesting on the screen. Tell us what is this going on? I mean, he's just going on and on. <laughs> uh, replying to every critic with the same thing. You are, you, you just like burning women. What is this about? This is this nonsense. This anyone, is nonsense. Anyone who criticizes his view, he'll accuse them with this view like burning women and keep tagging one by one by one by one. So many of them, this yeah. is pages and pages of tweets. And then, you know, uh, this... Uh, really gone out of his uh, control. This know. came from, uh, I, I had these from Shefali Vaidya's uh, Facebook wall. So, in one of, the, one of the messages, he wrote to somebody who criticized him, you love burning daughters. Random yeah. comment, Random. you love yeah. burning daughters. And then Shefali, of course, responds to that. So, why is he taking on fights like this for silly kind of reasons? I, I have no idea. I have no idea because uh, maybe it's he's very insecure of being questioned. Maybe he's uh, he just wants to say that... Or there are certain promoters, sponsors, uh, you know, that he's impressing. I have With no his idea. political... Uh, ideology. But but who would write on Twitter, you love burning daughters? I would not write it to anybody on Twitter, you love right. burning daughters. Particularly targeting some, naming, ta hashtagging or, yeah. or, or, or uh, tagging some people yeah. with it. And then yeah. the next one is also a, another interesting thing on Brahmins. Yes, so this was, uh, this was immediately after I started criticizing his work, My Gita, and he says, uh, <laughs> so he, had, he, he has to say that Brahmins and NRIs are the only people who criticize him, Brahmins because they hate non-Brahmins and NRI is because they hate him because he's in India, so whatever. And say, so Brahmins initially declared you lose caste if you cross the sea, Kalapani. As soon as going abroad became lucrative, they gave this rule. So he's instigating, he's suggesting that an entire community is hungry for money and goes across and gives up, gives up rules. How, how casteist is that? If, if it were any other caste, if he was talking about, you know, say Dalits, or if he's talking about OBCs, this would be a big issue. Another tweet, he's saying that, so he's, he's presenting himself as the savior and saying that anybody who attacks him are like Brahmins who have attacked people in the past, who have attacked saints in the past. So in, in this tweet, he says, in 16th century, Shudra Muni Balram Das, author of Odia Ramayana, wrote how Brahmins mocked him for commenting on Vedanta. It continues today. So he's equating himself with a saint in the past. And he's painting all critics as Brahmins who have uh, uh, troubled or who have uh, hounded non-Brahmins. So it's completely a caste, a caste equation fit into something which is, which is totally intellectual. Now this one, this one. If you move to America for dollars, give up Indian citizenship, you are Indian. If you criticize Brahmins, you are westernized. Ha! Huh. Makes no sense. So, you know, he's always shifting the topic when people raise these issues with him. Sure. Now, this is very interesting. This is a cute couple, Devdutt, <laughs> Devdutt and his pal, Wendy Doniger. So, we could also, if we were Freudian psychoanalysts, we could say these are two lesbians. One of them did a sex change and became a male. He's praised uh, Wendy Doniger many times, uh, Sheldon Pollock many times, this Aryan invasion theory many times. He's kind of politically aligned and very friendly and they help him. In fact, uh, in 2009, so uh, Devdutt wrote, Devdutt Patnaik wrote an article in which he waxed eloquent about Wendy Doniger. He said that, and I quote him, anyone who's serious about studying Hinduism needs to study the works of Wendy Doniger. Had it not been for her, I would not have had access to so many tales hidden in our scriptures. Now that's a glowing tribute to somebody. You would say uh, he probably considered her as a mentor in 2009. And so the tales hidden in our scriptures is the kind of fabrication we talked about. Probably. Uh, in December 2016, he took a stance which was critical of Doniger and Pollock. And this was strange. I never expected him to do that, uh, uh, given, given that he has you know, uh, considered her as a mentor in the past. But uh, he, he wrote in December 2016 that uh, the likes of Pollock and Doniger they need to be non-confessional, they need to indulge America's savior complex, they are pursuing activism in the guide of academia. Now this was very strange. So maybe we have had some impact. We, it, Coyne Radelst uh, in fact said uh, in February 2017, he wrote that Patnaik is now shifting to a stance critical of Doniger precisely because of work, uh, Raji Manutra's or your work. So He knows that the game is shifted. The popular opinion is going to be against him if he's supporting her. So he has to modulate. He's kind of distancing himself from Doniger and Pollock, and also saying that I'm I'm not even inspired by the likes of Conrad Elst or uh, 
uh, other Western uh, historians. Uh, Nitin, one of the guys who's been critical of uh, Devdutt Patnaik is Abhinav Agrawal. The brand that Devdutt Patnaik is, people take him at face value. Uh, people consider his books uh, consider his books to be authoritative, and it takes a long time for people to realize, even intelligent, smart people to realize that there are so many things wrong at so many levels with his with his work. So a case in point is Abhinav Agarwal, who comes from the same school as I do. I am Bangalore. He was a gold medalist there. He is a prolific book reviewer. He's reviewed more than 200 books on his blog. Uh, he's also active on Twitter. So uh, he had a favorable opinion of Devdutt Patnaik for years. In 2012, he reviewed the book, uh, uh, The Seven Secrets of Vishnu, and he called it insightful and readable. And there's a detailed review on his blog. In 2012, again, he reviewed the book, An Identity Card for Krishna, and he called it a short, fun read for kids. Again, a detailed review on his blog. In uh, 2013, he reviewed the book Sita, an illustrated retelling of the Ramayana, and he called it enriching, but not as spectacularly successful as, as Jaya. So you can see he's a, he's a person who is a very well-read, well-educated person, who for years has had a very favorable opinion of Patnayak, and uh, played, uh, paid glowing tributes to his books, called them spectacularly successful, enriching, uh, and so on. And in 2017, this year, May, in a blog post, uh, when he was reviewing the illustrated Mahabharata, the only blemishes in the book are the innumerable errors that have crept into the book as a result of the editors sourcing the story of the Mahabharata from Devdat Patnaik's adaptation, Jaya. These are just some, a small percentage of the outright errors, distortions, and subtle misinterpretations that Devdat's text contains. That is a very stinging criticism of I somebody. Think, I think he's also shifted more aligned with us recently and uh, distanced himself from Devdutt Patnaik. And, and I congratulate him because he's been able to change his views. And I don't know if I, I, I don't want to speak for him, but that's the guess, that's the sense I get. That the tide is turning more along the lines of what we are thinking. And, uh, but you know, that's only a few people who've taken on Devdutt Patnaik and shifted. Uh, but Nike is still exceedingly popular as far as the masses are concerned because they don't know these things. Sure. So uh, Abhinav Agarwal not only said that, he said, he pointed out as many as 11 distortions by Patnayak, painstakingly comparing each one to the critical text of the Mahabharata and the Gita edition. So it's not just me who is who's doing, who's saying that Patnayak gets, distorts things from, uh, from Mahabharata and Puranas. It is people like Abhinav Agarwal also who are doing that. So. Uh, in fact, he didn't even stop at that. He put a note on all his book reviews in November 2007, which said, he said, I believe Devdutt Patnaik's writings are influenced heavily by Western frameworks and agendas on the one hand, and introduce subtle and sometimes outright distortions in the interpretation of these texts. A small sample of the kinds of outright errors and distortions that would shame any scholar of Hinduism can be found on this blog post. And then he says, I therefore do not recommend any of Devdutt Patnaik's books that I have reviewed on my blog. So I congratulate uh, Abhinav uh, for the courage to say I am changing my stand because of new evidence and uh, congratulate you for understanding that he is located in the western framework and therefore there are all these errors that he's uh, he's done, taking liberties and mythologizing our tradition, so good for you. Good for Abhinav Agarwal and yeah. good, for, good for many people who follow him, who read him. I think the more people know about what Devdutt Patnaik is writing, what uh, the, the lack of his uh, knowledge of Sanskrit or even the text, the distortions, the, numer the numerous factual errors, the more people know about them, the more they'll realize that it is, it is just a brand build up on nothing. Uh, and I want to congratulate you. Thank you. Because, uh, I've been in these shoes where I know it's, uh, it's very difficult to take on an icon. It's a risky thing. It's a dangerous thing. They come and attack you. Uh, uh, but this is, this is part of the tapasya. This is part of the intellectual kshatriya uh, that you speak the truth. You stick to your, your uh, tradition. You defend your tradition. You defend the dharma. And no matter how powerful, popular the other guy is, and uh, you know, you speak the truth very audaciously. So I want to congratulate you on Thank that. You. And I want to encourage you, uh, to, and please look at his books. This is the Om Mala. This is the Hanuman Chalisa. 
and other books that he's writing more of them. And we'll have you back on the show uh, when more and more things come out. But meanwhile, please spread this message about Devdutt Patnaik. There's nothing personal against him. It's his work. I don't know anything about his personal life. He criticizes Brahmin, Nenarai, whatever. I don't know. I'm not going to criticize him in personal terms. His work is flawed. His work is distorting. It's dangerous. It's uh, misinforming the consumer. It is toxic. It's like putting toxic waste into the public sphere. Uh, and his sponsors need to know. His sponsors need to know. I think if Reliance is behind it, Reliance needs to be told. If Rupa is publishing his book. If Rupa is publishing his book. You know, R.K. Mehra, a dear friend of mine, amazing gentleman, one of the pioneers in Indian publishing. I had access to him. I would call him and say this and that. And he actually made many decisions about what to publish, what not to publish. But Kapish Mehra, his son, nice guy. I met him, known him for 10, 15 years. Uh, he is more sort of a business, what works in business he'll do. And this makes money, I guess. So, I, I mean, I cannot make, uh, I cannot tell him what to do for his business. But I would say that there's an ethics component. In the long run, uh, backing things which are such fraudulent, uh, maybe maybe it's sensational and make you money in the short run, but you know, you got to look at the long-term consequences about your reputation on who you're backing. So with that, I want to thank you and bring this to a closure. Namaste. Namaste. <laughs>